Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I am, as always, your unlucky guide on this crazy tour, uh, Nicholas Tyson. Um, so this week, we're actually going to be talking about one of my favorite authors and one of my eh, eh, not least favorite, but certainly like middle of the road authors as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, they're important, so we have to talk about them. Um, so strangely enough, I'm going to talk about the fun one first, and then I'm going to talk about the less fun one second, because I'm one of those people that when like you go to a holiday dinner and you know you get your plate of food, um, who eats all of the stuff that's tasty first and then leaves all the crappy stuff for last. <laughs> so I'm that kind of person. All right, so let's get into our thing or medoodle. Let's, let's close that. Sorry about this. There we go. Sure, there we go. Okay. So this week, we are going to be returning to a genre of literature that, well, it's not specific to Japanese, but sort of uh, Japanese literary history and sort of literary scholarship thinks of it as unique. I mean, it is unique in a lot of ways. And it's this genre right here known as Zuihitsu, which in um, later years, particularly in like modern Japan, like in the post-war period, especially, Zuihitsu just comes to refer to like essay writing in general. It's used essentially as a translation of the, the word essay for a while. Um, and also we're going to talk about a genre of literature, soan, bungaku, so the uh, so-called recluse literature and that's um our second dude today our the less fun one um but before we get into um the better dude yoshida ken cole sorry i i play favorites i apologize uh let's just remember that um the word zuihitsu literally means like to follow after the brush and it's a kind of genre of essay like writing that um interestingly enough defines itself retrospectively and that's important because it it tries to the, the genre tries to include earlier writers that didn't necessarily think of themselves in those terms and so it's both important to see how writers in the the kamakura well especially yoshida kenko sees himself as like following in a tradition while at the same time not really doing what they did like he he sees himself as having literary progenitors but but at the same time, also doesn't really follow those <laughs> literary progenitors that closely. And so this is the dude we're going to be talking about first in this first video. Um, I'm, actually, yeah, I will break these up into two separate videos. So Yoshida Kenko and Zuihitsu, generally speaking. So this guy, as you can see from his dates, comes from like the very end of the Kamakura period. Um, he was also closely associated with the, the Ashikaga clan. Um, you guys may or may not know why that's important now, but if for, for those of you who are familiar with sort of the, the next historical period that we'll be talking about, you'll recognize that name right away, because that is the, the clan that essentially takes over power and becomes the sort of the base for the next shogunate that will appear. Um, Yoshida is, so one of the things that he has in common with um, common old Cho Kamo no Chome, the, the dude I'll we'll be talking about later, is he sort of writing from a position of seclusion as a recluse. Um, he actually retired, but he spent most of his life at court um, and just kind of hanging around and doing sort of a lot of the standard court things, writing poems and just hanging out and having a generally fun time, I guess. I don't know. Court life, as described, even in the Heian period, never really sounded all that fun to me. It actually sounds kind of boring. Um, but that's how he spent most of his life. And then later in life, he became a Buddhist monk, and he decided to retire into a, into a personal seclusion. And it is from that position of seclusion that he wrote this book right here, the Tsurizurugusa, which that's how I'm going to refer to it. Maybe I'll say essays in idleness periodically. That's how Donald Keene translated it. And so as a result of that, that's often how most people note it. Um, but the word literally means like, so it's it's the it's the plants, it's the grasses or leaves, if, if you want to sort of extrapolate a little bit of, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't realize I still had on my, so this is the reading there, Tolzen. I'm going to turn off my Urikai Kun. I had to there were a couple of pronunciations that I had to look, name pronunciations that I had to look up earlier. So that's why I had it on. 
Anyway, so, uh, tsure, so this can be read tozen or it can be read um, tsure, tsure zure, um, which can mean like idleness, but also it's it's a weird word because it can have both a positive connotation and a negative connotation. So that's why I have it here as like idleness slash tedium. It, it could be just like, you know, what you do in your leisure or your free time, but it's also what you can what you do to occupy yourself because you're bored. <laughs> like it, can, it can mean either. Also, what's interesting is that Yoshida himself provides probably what is the best definition for this style of writing, Zuihitsu. So he says in, in his preface, let's take a look at that real quick. And the way he approaches this is also really great. What a strange, demented feeling it gives me when I realize I have spent whole days before this inkstone with nothing better to do, jotting down at random whatever nonsensical thoughts have entered my mind. And apologies if you occasionally hear the mewing of a cat. Um, my cat is trapped in the basement with me and she probably wants out, but I need to keep other people in my house out of the basement while I record, so let's catch 22. So what a let's begin let's let's take this apart for a second. What a strange demented feeling it gives me, sort of like this sort of like this state of being kind of like this almost out of body experience as you're so, so the inkstone that he's talking about. So you know he has this br this is a pen, but let's imagine it's a brush. So he has his brush and you know he's sitting before his inkstone. And he's just kind of like, uh. That's what these that's what these writings are supposed to represent. They're supposed to represent that feeling of kind of like uh, <laughs> And so the only thing that he can do to escape that sense of like perplexity is to just start randomly, as he says, jotting down at random whatever nonsensical thoughts have entered my head. So it's literally just the things that have come to mind, I'm just gonna write them down as they come into my head. Um, and if you recall from when we read um, Sei Shonagon, she says something kind of similar about her own pillow book. And that's sort of the, the idea that uh, Kenko is following, although we shall see that like his topics are very different and his approach to them is also very different. But that's, that, that idea, that sort of that aesthetic of like, I'm just idling away the hours and I'm gonna write whatever comes into my head. Like that's something that he clearly takes from Sei Shonagon. So let's take a look at one of these writings. So I want to start with number 10. I'd like, I really would like you guys, for you guys to read all of these. Um, I am only going to talk about a few of these because I have noticed over the past couple of weeks that my videos just keep getting longer and longer and longer. So in the interest of like, I don't know, not, in the interest of keeping things brief, I'll try to deal with, with fewer things and use them as, you know, emblems rather than talking about everything. So he says at the beginning of um, aphorism 10, that's, uh, that's what these usually are called aphorisms. You can section part, part 10. Anyway, they are separate. So as far as like Yoshida is considered, much like uh, Sei Shonagon, they are considered to be like separate. Each one is a separate idea, so a new thing. He says, a house I know is about a temporary abode, but how delightful it is to find one that has harmonious proportions and a pleasant atmosphere. One feels something somehow that even moonlight, when it shines into the quiet domicile of a person of taste, is more affecting than elsewhere. Um, what he's talking about here is sort of the idea of like sort of avoiding ostentation, um, where for him, it's much more interesting to sort of like go into somebody's house and give it, and this is going to be something that's in common, that you're going to see as a commonality both between Kenko and Chome, is that this idea that sort of like the house should, it's not that it just shouldn't be ostentatious or that it shouldn't be overdone. You know, as he says, where strange and rare Chinese and Japanese furnishings are displayed and even the grasses and the trees of the garden have been trained unnaturally is ugly to look at and most depressing. So it's, it's not just that like things are kind of overwrought or uninteresting in and of themselves, but it also become clear that like um, a home ought to sort of reflect the individual who lives there. You ought to be able to go into a place and look at it and go, ah, like I know exactly the kind of person who lives here because I sort of see them in this dwelling. And here that's implied, whereas with um, Chome, he'll pretty much just say it outright. So going back to our outline for, so what's interesting about, the, as, as I know, there's an echo of, you know, what 
Chome will say later. But also, in many ways, it sort of reflects the the zeitgeist to the period. This thing that we've seen over and over and over again, and it's especially in the tales of the Heike, where this idea that like things can fall apart at any time. You can begin life, you know, as like the high, like the most powerful noble. You can be the greatest aristocrat who's ever lived, but just because of the vicissitudes of life, you can like things can completely fall apart, and you can find yourself destitute. And so then the the implicit advice that exists both in Kenko's work and then also to a lesser extent in Chome's work is that you need to develop a sort of refined sense of detachment from things. And this is actually where he is very different from Seishonodon. Because for Kenko, like the ideal sort of aesthetic sense is one where you are aloof from the world and from society. Whereas Shonagon was very much in the world, in society, in what was going on, and interested in it and wanting to like depict it and be honest about it, rather than sort of talking about it from like a distance. Um, and you kind of so, sort of see the way in which these two authors, like like I said, Kenko is trying to emulate Shonogon, but at the same time, even as he's emulating her, he's doing something very different. And we can see that in section 19, where you, you can see this, the changing of the seasons is deeply moving in its every manifestation. It goes, orange blossoms are famous for invoking memories. Someone once remarked, and he talks about summer, and he talks about Tanabata. And so we see in here something like, um, Shonagon's list of things, like when, whenever she would talk about things as being like, you know, these things are beautiful, these things are especially interesting. Here, Kenko is doing something very similar. However, and he even like signals this, like he, he's not trying to be coy about it either. He, he says down here when he's talking about Tanabata, he says, so many, starting right here, so many moving sights come together in autumn especially and how unforgettable is the morning after an equinoctial storm that's a weird word <laughs> as i go on i realize that these sights have long since been enumerated in the tale of genji and the pillow book but i make no pretense of trying to avoid saying the same things again if I fail to say what lies on my mind, it gives me a feeling of flatulence. <laughs> if I fail to part you what I'm thinking, I will fart. <laughs> That's literally what he says. I shall therefore give my brush free reign. And so here's the, where this, I, this is like the whole idea of Zuihitsu is like following the brush that literally comes from Kenko. Kenko is the one who is inventing this idea of what a style of essay writing in Japanese is and what it looks like. But in doing so, he's also trying to like look back and include these earlier write, like he's trying to create a tradition for himself, even as he's the one who's inventing it. And so that's why he says right here, like this is the sort of the phrase that epitomizes like what Zuihitsu is. I shall therefore give my brush free reign. Mine is a foolish diversion, but these pages are meant to be torn up and no one is likely to see them. Again, we see something similar to what we saw in, say, Shon in Shonagon's writing, where there's this pretense that no one was supposed to see it. She says that, like, you know, it was a big scandal for her that, like, her pillow book suddenly came to light. But when you actually read the text, it's clear that it's written as a literary document. Like, it's written to be read. And the same is true here. Like this, this idea. So this is there's a pretense that Kenko is putting on this idea that like he didn't think it's like oh I just thought this was all going to get torn up and burned. I didn't realize anybody was going to read it, but it's not written in that way. It's written in a very high literary style. It is once again written to be read. So that's the thing that he actually like takes from Seishonagon. That's the thing that he's definitely aping in her work. However. The, like I said, the, the sort of the sense for like, oh, where is this? Oh, I guess it's earlier in the passage, I thought. I don't know, I guess I would just stick to that, that sense where like, I don't know, it's difficult because it's like, actually, if I just move on, I think I can show you where this sort of like, this starts to diverge. Let me see if, um, 
Uh, he talks about it at the end. Well, we'll get to that in a second. I'll get to sort of like where and why it, it diverges in a moment. So let's take a look at number um, 38. I thought there were, I thought there was a bit in that one passage. Like you have to remember guys that like I'm rereading these things many times and oftentimes I'm sort of like <laughs> looking at this from like a zeitgeist perspective. Like I remember the totality of what Kenko says and I don't always remember exactly what he says in a specific passage. So apologies for that. I should have done a better job of like reviewing, <laughs> reviewing each of these before I started talking about them. So in section 38, he talks about fame and why fame itself is an undesirable thing. In fact, what's interesting about a lot of the aphorisms, in fact, an earlier aphorism, um, in fact, one of the ones that's even selected here that I passed over, uh, talks a lot about like why, you know, sexual desire is something that, sh sh sexual desire, sex is not something to be desired or like the sort of sexual or like romantic infatuations are something to be avoided, which is definitely an like an anti Heian notion. Like the, the, the Japanese of the Heian period were all up into like their, their sexuality. They loved it, even if they didn't necessarily like talking about it. And so he says, let's see, in the third paragraph of this section, he says, one would like to leave behind a glorious reputation for surpassing wisdom and character. But careful reflection will show that what we mean by love of a glorious reputation is a delight in the approbation of others. So what he's saying here is that like, really what we call reputation and fame is just an obsession with other people's opinions. Neither those who praise nor those who abuse last for long. And the people who have heard their reports are likely to depart the world as quickly. Now here is where we see a clear divergence from Seishonogon. And really it's sort of the, the entire like literary aesthetic of the Heian period. Um, amongst those people so like in that earlier period there's this concept known as, as hitome which literally is people's eyes it's, it's literally what the word means but it refers to sort of like the the hyper the hyper like surveillant and vigilant nature of the society in which they lived they knew that everyone was like up in everyone else's business and so people behaved in such a way as to like establish their status and their reputation based upon the assumption that everybody was looking out for and like watching everybody else. But what Ken Cole is saying here is that like those people who are watching you, who are praising you or giving you crap, um, they don't really last all that long. They'll, they'll pass away too. And once they pass away, like then it doesn't really matter what they think of you anymore. Before whom then should we feel ashamed, he says. By whom should we wish to be appreciated? Fame, moreover, inspires backbiting. So there's this idea that sort of the higher, you, and again, we've seen this in all the literature of this period, like the higher you rise in society, the more likely that is to invite those who are going to try and tear you down. It does no, and he says, it does no good whatsoever to have one's name survive. A craving after fame is next most foolish. Very, very different. Like you, from Kenko's perspective, and, and we'll see a little bit of this in Shome as well, this idea that like you just want to be who you are. The sort of obsession with other people's opinions, with the way the world thinks of you, like that's not going to get you anywhere. The only place that it's likely to get you is ruin because the the, the further you build yourself, it, the idea is that sort of like, you know, the, the higher you rise, the further you fall. And so the... And that's based upon sort of the the politic. That's based upon like the historical understanding and the politics of the period. Where, for Kenko, like his society has very recently gone through this incredibly tumultuous transition from like one society, like one state of affairs to another. And so he, his contemporaries, and the people who immediately preceded him, like they saw this happen in real time. And the only way to like protect yourself from that so those vicissitudes is basically never to build yourself up that high to begin with because the idea is that sort of like you know if you build yourself all the way up to here that's also how far you can fall but if you only build yourself up to here this is all the further you can fall so like the more humble and the more meager your means are in life the less you will suffer as a result of losing it all and that sort of that obsession with suffering from loss is very indicative of this period. And it's also indicative of, as I've said before, the, the Buddhist, the religious outlook of this period. The idea that like, you know, the obsession with the Nembutsu comes from the fact that 
you can't do anything to perfect or save yourself. The only thing that will save you is just like committing yourself to the Amida Buddha and hope that they do it for you. All right. Yeah, so I noted that th this idea that wealth tends to attract disasters, lifting yourself up. Um, he also makes this, this, oh yeah, it's at the end of that section. He ends, in, he ends in the sort of like nomic way. If in your delusion you seek fame and profit, the results will be as I will be as I have described. All is unreality. Nothing is worth discussing, worth desiring. The world itself is to be completely turned away from. Again, even though he's modeling himself on Seishonogon, like that is com a completely different outlook on life. And he literally he comes around and says, all is unreality. There is this, and there's a sort of Buddhist underpinning. The idea that sort of what we understand as our consciousness is fundamentally unreal. And that comes straight out of Buddhism and not just pure land Buddhism, but that is almost a central tenant to Buddhism. And it's almost a return to that notion of sort of like the ascetic detachment. Now in sort of earlier Buddhist traditions, particularly in Indian Buddhist traditions, there is this notion of sort of the middle way. The middle way refers to how you're neither supposed to like completely remove, you're neither supposed to become like a complete ascetic where, you know, you don't eat and you just sort of like let your body deteriorate. So you still eat, you still live in the world and that's fine. But at the same time, you're supposed to be unconcerned with the affairs of the world. And what Kenko is doing here is he's trying to return in many ways. And it's, it, it is indicative of the way Pure Land Buddhism itself tried to return to that sort of original sense of like detachment of the, from the world, giving up on the world and sort of recognizing that your only real salvation comes from everything outside of the world that we live in. Whether you agree with that or not, I mean, that is sort of the, the basic religious sen sentiment. Now, in the final section we're going to look at for today, section 137, um, actually, yeah, let's just go to it. So it's the one that, I mean, the titles here are literally just taken from the first line. <laughs> are we to look at cherry blossoms only in full bloom, the moon only when it is cloudless? So here he's referring to these, these like poetic tropes of the Heian period and the way in which people traditionally look at these, these natural phenomena and the way they understand them. He says in the second pair, actually, well, no, before I get to that, he says, people commonly, it's right here. People commonly regret that the cherry blossoms scatter or that the moon sinks in the sky, and this is natural. But only an exceptionally insensitive man would say, this branch and that branch have lost their blossoms. There's nothing worth seeing now. Now, this is really interesting. Because if you recall, the, the, the natural phenomenon that people in the Heian period would like to typically like to talk about in literary terms were sort of the phenomenon of, you know, blossom, you know, things coming into bloom or the cherry blossoms falling. Now, when he says here that like this and that branch have lost their blossoms, there's nothing worth seeing now. So the idea is that sort of like the, the, the cherry tree itself, there's something valuable in its like state of desolation. But there's something interesting about it once all of those other sort of like <gasps> ooh moments have gone. And he goes and he follows this by saying, in all things, it is the beginnings and ends that are interesting. So he's saying that it's both. It's both the sorts of thing, it's both those periods of transition that the the period that the people of the Heian period were obsessed with and the absence that results after those things have passed that are interesting. Does the love between men and women refer only to the moments when they are in each other's arms? The man who grieves over a love affair broken off before it was fulfilled, who bewails empty vows, who spends long autumn nights alone, who lets his thoughts wander to distant skies, who yearns for the past, who yearns for the past in a dilapidated house. Such a man truly knows what love means. Let's take that last bit again. I want to repeat it. The man who yearns for the past and a dilapidated house, such a man truly knows what love means. So from Kenko's perspective, the person who really understands beauty, the person who really understands the value of a particular aesthetic is the one who contemplates it after it is gone. Now that's a very, very, very different take on things. In other words, What's interesting is that it's clearly derived from that early literary aesthetic. 
He's clearly taking from it, but he's building upon it in such a way where he's sort of like filling in the gaps or rather talking about the gaps. I mean, it's, it, there's, a, there's a weird irony here because he's, he's talking about absence as having a value in and of itself. And this is reinforced when later on he says, and in many ways, this is sort of like the, the, the money shot of, of the text. And are we to look at the moon and cherry blas blossoms with our eyes alone? How much more evocative and pleasing it is to think about the spring without stirring from the house, to dream of the moonlit night though we remain in our room. Now, this is very, 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 very different from that earlier aesthetic, because essentially what he's saying is that it, it's not just as good, but it is in fact preferable to contemplate these natural phenomenon in a purely intellectual way, in a purely like, purely in the mind, from one's own home, from one's own hut, as we'll see with Chomei. And that sort of reflects what he was saying earlier, that the, the man who yearns for the past in a dilapidated house, such a man truly knows what love means. And so then in this case, the person who truly understands what beauty is, is the person who can contemplate these things without actually having to go out into the world and like physically experience them. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, we, we live in a time when in many ways sort of the aesthetic is the opposite. Like we often presume that like the only way you can truly understand something is by like going there and experiencing it yourself. Um, Kenko is actually saying the exact opposite. He's saying that the, the, better I exper the better experience is the ideal one. And interestingly enough, the ideal one is the one that is removed from reality. And again, so this, this reflects this Buddhist aesthetic that I've been talking about again and again and again, that like the ideal is removing yourself from the world, detachment, not being concerned with the world. Like you, there, he recognizes that, the, so in other words, what he's taking from these, these early, earlier Heian writers is that there are things in the world that are beautiful and interesting and worthwhile, but the ideal is to sort of take them and bring them back into your state of detachment. And so what's interesting about this is that for Kenko, in many ways, desolation is actually a preferable point of view. The, the cherry, it's like the cherry tree that, that has no blossoms whatsoever. Like the, the point at which like they're completely gone and you only sort of remember what they were when they were still there. That is actually a preferable point of view. But even as Kenko asserts this, what's interesting is that he, he kind of pokes fun at himself. And sort of, this is the, the bit that I wanna end on. So he says near the end of what has been exerted for you in, in this week's reading, <laughs> he says, so he talks about like a soldier who goes to war. So yeah, it's, it's this bit right here. The soldier who goes to war, knowing how close he is to death, forgets his family and even forgets himself. The man who has turned his back on the world and lives in a thatched hut. By the way, Kinkle, he doesn't, he doesn't say like, you know, when I did this, when I rejected the world and went to live in a thatched hut. So th there's two, there's two things going on here. One, remember Kenko is the later writer. He's actually kind of alluding to Cholme, sort of, in his statement here. But he's also talking in general about sort of like the, the ascetic type, the, the person who like, the hermit who like removes themselves from the world and goes and lives in a hut in the middle of nowhere. So that's two things. So he's talking, so it's a literary illusion to Chome, um, sort of a general take on sort of like the, the literary ascetic, but he's also talking about himself because he is one of these people. He is one of these people who removed himself from the world and decided to write a bunch of like strange aphorisms from his seclusion. The man who has turned his back on the world and lives in a thatched hut, quietly taking pleasure in the streams and rocks of his garden, may suppose that death in battle has nothing to do with him, but that is a shallow misconception. So it's interesting here that like in this section where in many ways he's proposing the idea that the ideal is to sort of like remember and to think about the things of the world from a position of seclusion. He's also saying that like 
even in seclusion, the world is never far from you. In many ways, there, there's a sort of perverse irony here that you can't actually seclude yourself, perfectly at least. He says, that is a shallow misconception, this idea that you can completely separate yourself. No, that's not possible. Does he imagine that if he hides in the still recesses of the mountains, the enemy called, the enemy called change will fail to attack? When you confront death, no matter where it be, it is the same as charging into battle. That change will come to us all, and that change, sort of ironically, is the one permanent thing in the world. And so I wanted to, to leave you guys on that point, and also to stop the share, to highlight the fact that when you're, when you're reading these aphorisms and you're looking at Kenko's text, there is also, there's always a kind of, Marx would call it a dialectic going on, and Hegel would call it a dialectic, but this idea that you have the, these, these opposite ideas that are in sort of like constant contest with each other. So on the one hand, you have the, the Heian aesthetic, of, which is sort of obsessed with society, the world and the things of this world. And then you have this sort of new, sort of like pure land inflected aesthetic, which is sort of focused on detachment, desolation and understanding of like, you know, the infinite transience of things. But what Kenko is doing, Kenko is a smart enough guy not to, not to say like, you know, this is better than this thing. He actually recognizes how they're sort of in conflict with one another. And so there is a dialectical relationship between these two things that you have to understand. There's a kind of productive contradiction. And so it's not that like the Heian aesthetic is being abandoned, but rather sort of the Heian, again, it's this retrospective idea that we keep seeing again and again and again. Just like, you know, the guy in his dilapidated house who thinks about the past, it's seeing and appreciating that, that older aesthetic from a very different historical perspective, which has caused, you know, it's caused Lady, it's caused Nijo to see these things in this way. It's caused Yoshida Sarkenko to see things in this way. Like everyone is seeing the past in, in a new light because of their historical circumstances. So again, I know that in this unit, I've been harping on this point again and again and again, but it's important to, to keep this in mind because it's how the literary aesthetic is shifting over time. Again, I want to emphasize this, that in this course, the, the, what I do not want you to come away from this course thinking is that sort of like there is a sort of trans-historical Japanese ideal. It didn't exist. It never existed. And in fact, there are many Japanese aesthetics. There are many Japanese ideals. They change over time, and they're always reacting to each other. In other words, <laughs> you actually have to give these people more credit than this idea of like, oh, you know, Japanese culture is this thing. That's actually really boring and stupid because Japanese culture is actually many things interacting with each other, like representing each other, misrepresenting each other, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually much more involved than that. So that's where we're going to leave Kenko for now. Um, in a little bit, I will be turning to our good buddy, um, Kamono Chome, Chom and I will see you all then.